Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs discusses the importance of data recording for efficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this week's uh, Let's Talk Dairy webinar. So this week, I'm um, just going to do a very small piece. Might sound a bit inconsequential maybe to many of you that are tuned in, but um, just going to talk about a little bit about record keeping this week uh, and how it can improve efficiency on your farm. So uh, I'll just start sharing a few slides here in relation to this topic. So and by all means, ask questions. So better data, better results. Um, so you'll see by the trend of the presentation now as we go through it uh, as to why I'm talking about it or why I put this title on the, on the slide. Um, obviously, everybody's in the thick of calving at the moment. And uh, there's a great opportunity here, I suppose, and people will be saying, God, I'm putting a burden on people to make uh, record information um, at this stage. But it's, it's as simple as, sorry, um, it's as simple as uh, making use of technology, I would see myself. Um, maybe that mightn't suit everybody, but um, it is an opportunity for people to make use of simple uh, technology to record better information. And later on in the season, when like with the best will in the world, what happens this morning in four or five weeks time is going to be gone out of your head. So if there was a cow down with milk fever today, um, what's the chances of you remembering that as we approach the breeding season? And the impact that this can have in terms of better uh, outcomes for the animals that do suffer problems during the calving season. There's many different studies done in relation to the propensity for those cows not to turn up in calf at the end of the season if they've had a, an incident during the course of the year. So then we move on to the whole milking routine, etc., and recording information around that and how that can be important as well. So starting off, I suppose, there's a small bit of a, an industry good associated with this as well, obviously. So I'm starting with the calving info. So as we calve the herd, vast majority of cows now to, at, at this stage talking to vets, they would say that the, the number of difficult calvings that they get called to now is very limited compared to what it would have been many years ago. Uh, and as a result, um, it's probably going to be a case of the, the vast majority of your cows are going to calve. So calving difficulty, as I said, the vast majority of those are going to be easy calving. Um, however, it's what's important here i suppose is there's two elements to it the and you'll see there the first point below is it an easy calving is it some assistance considerable assistance or veterinary assistance there are the four categories that you're looking at dealing with and the main reason for your cells to identify these cows from the start rather than just having a, everything appearing as a one is that you can identify cows that are at risk of problems going back in calf so as i said you may have had the vet out today if it's just a difficult calving, if it's not a section, then the chances of you remembering that cow 70 had to have the vet to handle her or had to have the vet to help to calve her on the 7th or the 10th of February, when it comes to the 7th or the 10th of May, when it's time for breeding, is unlikely that you're going to remember that unless you have a record of it somewhere. So I didn't, it, it, and as I said, a lot of the cases here with the best will in the world because of the environment that the cows are calving in, maybe with, no matter how clean you do try to keep it, when you handle a cow, the opportunity is there that you're going to introduce bacteria into that animal. And that puts them at risk of getting an infection, a uterine infection. And uterine infections, even though they can be mild in, in many cases, and in a lot of cases can be overcome by the animal's immune system themselves they can be at a higher likelihood of not going back in calf as a result of that. Uh, and many of you will have seen that in your own herds as you've gone along, that you may have a cow turn up at the end of the season, having appeared to be cycling okay and everything going okay. That's not to say that doing anything with her was going to make a difference, but the reality of it is, is at least if you had her checked out and knew that she was work, functioning properly prior to breeding, you'd be better off rather than finding out at the end of the season when she's empty. So from your own perspective, uh, recording that calving ease uh, information is important when it comes to the breeding season. In the whole industry good side of things, obviously, uh, many of you should be, or, or we would hope are using AI and we would be encouraging more people to use AI. And concerns always, uh, real, uh, people always have concerns in relation to calving ease. Obviously it's a significant issue. Um, for dairy farmers in particular, I suppose beef farmers maybe are slightly more tolerant of calving difficulty, I think. Um, however, dairy farmers, because of the compactness of the calving in particular, 
don't want particularly to have to have handle a lot of cows for calving uh, and the information that we feed back with it with the calving calving survey and i was looking at some information yesterday from icbf there and actually calving survey data i would have thought should have been much higher but it's actually a, a, around 55 or 60 percent i think it was uh, is all the information that's going back which is disappointing really considering it's very straightforward in a piece of information to record uh, so that's an industry good. It feeds back into the uh, into ICBF, obviously. ICBF will relay that onto the AI companies, et cetera. And we get a picture of whether an animal is easy to calve or not. And that's important then for bull selection, obviously, in due course. So um, moving on to the next piece, I suppose, this is probably the most critical piece, I suppose. As I said, when we look at the calving ease, the vast 80 90% of cows, probably more, um, probably closer to 95% of cows potentially, will fall into category one of easy calving calves themselves. Some assistance is very minor, it might only be a slight pull. Considerable assistance obviously is significant help uh, and obviously a vet is vet. Um, but in terms of what happens post calving then, um, cows that get milk fever, and again, there's been a bit of it around this season as well, uh, maybe not as much to, to the best of my knowledge anyway, I could be wrong, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been as much around this year, maybe, or it hasn't been talked about as much this year compared to pre last year, where there was quite a bit of it at the start of the season. Um, milk fever, there's a significantly greater chance when a cow gets milk fever that they're susceptible to so many other issues. Uh, mastitis is one. Uh, the likelihood of being empty at the end of the season is significantly, quite, quite significantly increased because muscle contraction is reduced because of calcium issues in the body. That means that the uterus doesn't contract post-calving, doesn't flush out the, the, um, the post-calving fluid. So they could be at risk of uh, retained placenta in that situation as well. And even if they're not, the, the, the uteri uterus doesn't involute, is, which is shrink um, as, as normal. And as a result of that, they are slower to cycle, maybe maybe have poorer uh, cyclicity in general, and a far greater likelihood of not going in calf during the following breeding season. Similar with ketosis, obviously low energy, uh, the whole system starts to shut down really. And as a result, again, they can be empty come the end of the season. I suppose the retained placenta is one that's major, a major one that's probably like milk fever cases and ketosis and so forth. They're quite evident, I suppose, in that you have to get the vet maybe to deal with the, the milk fever um, and ketosis issues. Retain placenta, some cows can hold some a bit of clearing even. It mightn't even be that significant an amount. But just recording that bit of information. So uh, identifying that whatever the cow's number is, she just had a bit of a clearing hanging from her for maybe 24 hours like ideally cows should be clearing themselves within 20, within 12 hours. If they're not cleared within 12 hours, then technically they're falling into a category of, of retained placenta. That bit of material, as you well know from when, if a clearing is, is if you throw a clearing out to one side maybe, and it's not thrown into the dung heap or whatever, they can they go off quite quickly because it's dying material basically, and uh, can create quite a stench. So if you imagine that that now is inside in the cow, uh, Imagine the bacteria, imagine the environment that it's creating within the cow, even if it's only a small piece of it. Um, so you can see that that can, that can then potentially lead on to point four there, which is your metritis. Our metritis can sometimes turn into pyometria as well, which is an extremely strong infection and can result in um, problems with the ovaries in terms of uh, cysts, et cetera, occurring. Metritis itself then obviously is just inflammation. So uh, that itis is always uh, mastitis, metritis, there are conditions of inflammation. Uh, so you have an inflammation of the uterine lining there, which is obviously quite painful. Um, and if we don't deal with it, then the likelihood of that animal going in calf then is quite significant. So again, milk fever, cow down, very obvious situation. Ketosis, smell of, from the breath, cow off farm not eating, very obvious again. Retained placenta, as I said, may not be that they don't clear fully or, or that, they, that they don't hold a full clearing. It may be that they, they clear clearing breaks and that there's a piece left behind. This is something that you can see maybe as you're herding in cows for milking or whatever. It should be noted somewhere. So as I said, cow 100, she's calved a day. There's so, something hanging from her. 
it should be noted that she has a retained placenta. While it mightn't be a classic full retained placenta, it's important to note, identify that cow that she didn't clear fully. She could be a candidate, as I said, then for metritis or pyometria, or metritis, as I said earlier, from the calving difficulty situation is bacteria could have been introduced or dirt could have been introduced into the uterus at the time of calving. So while handling the cow um, and uh, metritis can develop from that. So if we see that any dirty discharges on cubicles when we're rounding up cows or anything like that, make a note of it. Uh, making that note is important then come just in advance of the breeding season. It's worth looking at these cows to make sure that they're functioning okay. Grass technique, if they'll survive it, um, obviously it has muscle staggers. So they've, again, it's a contraction issue. It knocks them up for six really, as, as people will know, and they don't really perform well. So again, take a note of it. I, as I said, again, it's it's a case of it's quite an obvious event. Um, you may have to get the vet for it. Most people will have to get the vet for it. But again, if we don't record that information, we don't know um, subsequently why is this cow repeating or maybe that kind of a scenario. You're a, a, asking questions. If you've good information, you can look back and you can find. And I think that's probably why, why I decided to look at this, looking at data, looking at situations in my own case at home and my own farm. Where, we don't, where you don't follow through on these animals later in the season, they actually, like, especially in a, con, in a confined breeding system where we're up in, as we should be operating in Ireland. So starting breeding, maybe 25th of April, 24th, 25th of April, stopping breeding um, 18th of July, that kind of 12 week breeding window. Those cows can potentially go in calf, but they won't go in calf in that breeding window if they're not uh, examined and, and, and look, they may be fine, but if we don't check them out, the risk of them going out of the system is higher and that's a cost to the system. The next uh, piece is in relation to milking and lameness. So milking and lameness are piece, parts of, uh, like there's a 4% of DBI is, is made up of health traits and the health traits that feed into that are milking, lameness and SEC. Uh, so SEC is picked up through milk recording. Um, the, the mastitis issues, we'll say, sorry, I said milking, uh, mastitis, SCC and lameness are the factors that feed into the health index. Mastitis is only as good as the records that are being kept. And Dan has spoken here before, uh, and he talks about it regularly anytime I'm talking to him about the lack of record keeping around mastitis is a major fundamental flaw at farm level. Um, and, some, and in some cases, people do have... Um, uh, records of it, but they aren't feeding back anywhere. And as I said, it comes back to the greater good, I suppose, as well, in terms of identifying cows that have higher propensity for mastitis. These health traits are heritable, and many, many of you will see it. I would think lameness is a classic example. If you ever look at cows that are lame within your herd and look back at their who their dam is, there's a likelihood or there's a strong likelihood that they will have had feet and leg problems as well, potentially down through the years as well so identifying them from again the industry good is important but from a mastitis point of view if there's a problem in the herd if you can identify and have good information there if Dan Crowley has to come to you to help you with a cell count problem or a mastitis issue the more information you can provide to Dan the quicker he can come with a solution to the problem or a potential solution to the problem so identifying the quarter might be as simple as if you're using a notebook, just drawing a little circle and putting a cross in the middle of it to make four quarters of it. Identify the quarter that the cow had the problem in. Um, what I mean by how this helps to build a picture if a problem arises, if we're getting a lot of cell count, if we're getting a lot of mastitis, is it all happening in the one quarter? Is it contagious mastitis that's passing through the liner? Or is it random mastitis, which may be just being picked up outside? Again, it's just... just information that creates a, a, a the right situation to create to give a solution to a problem or to identify the problem probably and maybe put a, a corrective action in place identifying cows that have had cases of mastitis is going to be very very important because as of the 28th of january blanket guy, dry cow therapy is gone and um, so we're now living in a new era what exactly the legislation is going to pan out to be, what number of cows or what way it's going to work out for the dry cow period of the coming year has still to be fully decided. But we do know that we will not be able to blanket dry cow therapy uh, across entire herds. So it's going to be important that we identify cows that have had a case of mastitis, still debate around whether if a cow has mastitis, 
in February or March and subsequently goes through the rest of the lactation without any issue around cell count, cell count is corrected. So the, the tube or the treatment that is offered, whether that be injectable or, or just mastitis tube, uh, corrects the problem in, in terms of the mastitis. Um, is that cow then suitable for selective later in the year? Cell count would suggest potentially, but at the moment, the theory is that if a cow has had a case of mastitis during the lactation, they wouldn't be put forward for a selective dry cow uh, option. So it's going to be important that we know the cows uh, that have had the cases of mastitis in order to um, have a, a safer approach, I suppose, in the short term to selective dry cow later in the year. Then the other thing is identifying repeat offenders. Many people will often uh, be able to say that they think that a cow has had mastitis um, earlier in the season as well. Unless now it's very, in, the cases occur in very rapid succession, um, repeat offenders can sometimes go unidentified if there aren't good records associated with them. Um, is it the same quarter? Is it a different quarter? Uh, again, it's probably the more, more often they're getting mastitis, the more problematic they are. So it's uh, helping to identify cows, maybe not to breed. So if they get a lot of mastitis during the spring, you maybe just leave those cows empty, don't serve them at all uh, in the breeding season. Or if you are insisting on breeding them, that you wouldn't breed replacements from them. Because as I said, going back to the EBI, health traits are part of it. They are heritable. They do lead to better outcomes when we breed for better health. Um, and if we can identify these cows early on and uh, not breed replacements from them, it means that we're in a likely better place in order to uh, strengthen the capacity of the herd to withstand mastitis infections into the future. Now, it's going to be something that's going to take time over uh, to build up. Um, it's not going to be the 100% solution to it. We're not going to be able to breed the perfect herd in terms of not uh, succumbing to mastitis because it's an environmental issue as well. Um, but it is, it's all helping. They're more resistant to it. It's a similar to resistance for TB, resistance for uh, liver fluke as well, which have, have been identified. They can, it's, it's possible to breed against them. Lameness, identify the issues there. Again, if we have common trends, it may not necessarily be an issue with cow. It may be an issue with, with the farm and talking to Patrick going in relation to farm infrastructure, uh, talking to Tom Fallon maybe about it as well short turns, tight turns, leading to white line disease, um, poor road surfaces leading to puncture issues. So again, if we can build up information in terms of what are the problems, why is the, the hoof pairing person having to lift these cows? What treatment is he giving to these cows? And um, as a result of that, then we can identify whether it's an, uh, there's a, a specific cause within the farm that's causing some of the problems in relation to lameness. And again, coming back then to that heritability issue of it, I suppose if cows are repeatedly getting lame, um, notwithstanding that it can be down to physical issues on farms in particular that can, could be the cause of the lameness, but there is a genetic component to this as well. And if we can record the information in relation to that, it will help to um, build a stronger index in relation to health, uh, allow for selection of bulls with stronger health sub-indexes which will mean for better herds into the future, okay? Then I suppose the question is how, so for me, um, I'm not, I'm not a, a, young, uh, a young buck, but I'm not an old fella either. I suppose I would be in favor of the technology side of things. Uh, ICBF have a Herd Plus app, which people can use for free if they want to. Then there are the commercial apps. Uh, Herd Plus, obviously you would have to, you have to be signed up for Herd Plus. Commercial apps, such as Agrinet, Herd, Herd App, Herd Watch, um, or Kingswood's Herd App as well. They're all available, cost associated with them, but then, like anything, I suppose, that's going to do something for you, there is going to be a charge associated with them. Then the third option is the old pencil and paper, basically, so the notebook. Uh, it is the, the downside of the notebook is that if you don't move that information from there into some sort of a recording mechanism, so maybe using the... Um, the computer to record the information and to her plus will say eventually uh, the info is only of benefit to you so I said at the uh, earlier on there just the, the whole industry good of recording this information you might say what's in it for me well calving ease figures that you get back through uh, the, the catalogs for bulls um, mastitis resistance will say those health traits all, all of that is built on good information coming back in from firms and I was looking at some information there recently, and, and you will be well aware 
of how Norwegian red was, um, or maybe Swedish red as well. They've had a high level of emphasis on health traits with over 50 years in their herd book. And they have are well known now for having very good uh, mastitis resistance as a result. But when you look at what they've done in Sweden and Norway, there's an awful lot of information feeding back in relation to those health traits. Now it's quite stringent, I suppose, in terms of if a cow gets mastitis, it has to be under a veterinary license, basically, or veterinary prescription that they're treated. But that information then is automatically going back into the database in relation to that cow having mastitis. Um, and that's just that's built that that over 50, 60 years, that index has become known worldwide for being very, very strong in terms of health traits around uh, mastitis and lameness in particular. The final point, I suppose, on it would be that technology has the benefit of easing paperwork. So people that use these apps already will know that they can be walking from the yard, walking into the house, and they can register their cows nearly while they're washing their hands after coming in from the, or register their calves after wa walking into the house uh, while you're washing your hands. Job done, no risk of, of make, making mix-ups, we'll say transcribing information from a notebook onto registration booklets or whatever. Um, the other thing is, of course, in terms of remedy recording, then for board B inspections, take out the phone, insert the information into it there and then, job done, ticks the box from a board B point of view, then you're able to share that information when you have your board B inspection. So as I said, look, first, it may not work for some people, but technology and these apps and all these apps here are generally quite intuitive. So uh, people should be able to work these. If you're able to work a smartphone, you will be able to work these. Um, okay, um, the one argument you'd have for it is maybe it's not ideal to go taking on to something like this in the, in the middle of the calving season. But if you have someone uh, helping you out on the farm, maybe that's tech savvy, they could start you on the, on the road here. Some huge benefits associated with it then in terms of um, one that I've left out there actually is the, uh, one that is Monster Bovine's app as well, uh, that I should have heard the ops that should be in there too. Um, they, it, 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 all of these apps will tell you about cows due to calve, so you'll get a list of when they're going, wh what cows are closest to calving, so you can have them maybe put together close to the calving area, that kind of stuff. Um, filtering animals, identifying different groups, all of these things, technology just makes these so much easier compared to maybe sifting through a notebook looking for numbers, etc. So for me, technology is the way to go. But again, I'd rather people would record the information in a method that's going to work for them rather than taking on to something that's not going to work for them at all. Finally, I suppose just to summarize what I've covered today. So good record keeping can improve farm performance. So from a milk, uh, uh, milking perspective, we'll say around cell count, et cetera, identifying cows that have problems with mastitis, identifying the cows that should be culled, identifying the cows that may not be potential candidates for selective dry cow. I think in particular at the moment in relation to calving difficulty and all the concerns and issues that can crop up around calving. And generally speaking, uh, th that's going to cover 90% of the issues that occur. So if we get over the hump in terms of the post-calving period, cows will generally settle um, and, and run away relatively smoothly uh, with the exception of, of um, other diseases, maybe like uh, viruses or whatever that can, can sometimes affect the farm. But if we can get over the calving period generally well, we're pretty much set up for the rest of the season. But the records around those, as I said, calving ease, any incidences that occur, especially milk fever, uh, ketosis and retained placenta in particular, um, and your calving difficulty, and identify those cows to be checked out. As I said, they could be fine. They, there could be no issue at all with them, but it's worth checking those cows out before breeding um, to make sure that they're cycling properly. There can be the smallest level of infection in, in the uterus sometimes that can draw a cow off kilter. We get these irregular heat cycles then. Um, obviously, there's treatment required then, maybe midway through the breeding season to resolve it. That's a cost. Why not incur that cost earlier in the season and increase the likelihood of that cow going in calf for you? Um, the system that you use is obviously up to yourself. As I said, I would have a preference for the technology. I think that it's going to, to be, the, it, it just makes life an awful lot easier. So you should consider using technologies that's relatively simple to use and can make life easier for people as well. So that's pretty much it for today. Um, if there's any questions, I'll take them. Um, so as I said, it's just a, 
implement a system that will work for you. Good record keeping leads to better outcomes. Uh, don't underestimate the power that it can have. Uh, and as I said, it's as simple as just recording anything that you see as you're going along. So as I said, cows and cubicles, dirty discharge behind them, just take a note of it. It's worth, it's, it's not going to do any harm to have it recorded. You can then filter a list later on in the season to see uh, the problems that were uh, identified during the calving season. We'll say, draft out those cows, get them checked out by your vet. And as I said, that will lead to more efficient um, breeding season for you. And that's all leading to better farm efficiency, higher profitability, because we're not losing cows out of the system. Um, maybe cows could be slight with, with sub subacute infections like that. They can slightly underperform as well, but we wouldn't necessarily see that. Um, from day-to-day -day management, we'll say they might seem to be, they might look like a duck and quack like a duck, but they might be performing as they should be. So um, that's it for today. We'll be back next week. I'm going to do a little piece on uh, once a day milking at the start of the season. So I'm going to talk to a person that's using once a day in the early part of the season just to see how it works for them from the point of view of reducing labor because it's a busy time of year for you uh, and how that works on the on farm for them. So we've we've seen Emer talking about how it is effective in terms of, and the impact that it has, has on performance, etc. Um, in the herds here and under, under a research environment. But when we move out to commercial farm level, what's it doing for farmers there? So it's being proposed as a, a labor saving technique. How is it working on farm? So we're going to talk to somebody next week in relation to that. I uh, hope you can join us then. There's one question after coming in. Rehydration drinks for the cow post calving worth the money? Um, that's a good question, I suppose. There probably isn't a huge amount of data that I've seen that would suggest that, uh, that they're of any major benefit. Um, they, again, I would think a lot of it can feed back to the mineral status of the cow in the run into calving, knowing uh, potential risk issues on, uh, on individual farms. So the whole situation there would be like, are you likely to have, have you high K in your silage? Are you going to see a lot of milk fever? Should you be loading in more CalMag in advance of calving because you know that you have this high K silage? Should you be putting in some straw to try to dilute the silage uh, or the K in the silage, that kind of situation? They are quite expensive from, uh, in a lot of cases. Um, many people swear by them. The jury's out for me though. Uh, I see plenty of cows calved um, that don't get any rehydration drinks and continue to milk 550 or 600 kgs of milk solids quite comfortably. So is there a role for them? I think if a cow has had trouble, um, like definitely, I think I've seen there from maybe Eamon Sheehan in, in Kilkenny that would say rehydration in, in the face of disease issues is definitely doing something for him um, in relation to recovery. And I think it's probably something that we could look at in, in relation to if they have a disease or they have an incidence that, uh, that rehydration has a role to play there. Uh, for As to whether they, they should be given to every cow post calving, I, I'm not really sure. I, I don't, I haven't, as I said, I don't see the research there that backs up the, the justification to do it. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, wish you well for the week. Hope things are going well for you on farm. Wish you all the best for the week ahead. Uh, and we'll talk to you next week. And thanks for tuning in. Bye for now. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday. So do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and thanks for listening.